Hello, welcome to this webinar on teaching income inequality and wage discrimination. My name is John Clark. Just before I start, a quick reminder about our revision workshops coming up. We've got a new one called Strong Foundations coming along in November and December, aimed at Year 13 students, helping them revise topics that they covered in Year 12, whilst thinking about skills and assessment styles that they're going to need to know for the end of year exams. OK, we're going to be thinking primarily today about wage discrimination for gender and the gender pay gap in the UK. We'll have a quick discussion about how wages are determined, what we mean by wage discrimination, and ultimately what are the consequences of that gender pay gap. Another reason why we're thinking about this topic in particular then is because we think it's one of those ones that could turn up in that paper 3 synoptic paper on the basis that whilst labour economics and wage determination is primarily a, a micro topic the fact that we may want our workers to be more effective and efficient could be seen as supply side policy and therefore macro so that's why we're thinking about that one today and just thinking about the three major rewarding bodies that's where this topic turns up. If you look at the Edexcel one, actually inequality is there in the macro side of things. So we think it has a, a good opportunity of turning up in that paper three. Okay, quick reminder then. Uh, the demand for labour is derived. We demand labour so that that labour can produce products or undertake services for us. So it's completely dependent on the demand for those products and those services we illustrate it using labour demand and labour supply curves looking very similar to demand and supply curves that students have drawn plenty of other times quick reminder to you though often students forget to make sure that they alter the axes for this make sure that they do that make sure that they uh, label the diagram correctly as well and of course one thing that students do find a little bit strange about this diagram is that this time the firm is in control of the demand curve and it's the individual making the supply or groups of individuals making the supply so a slightly more complex way of looking at demand and supply when we think about how wages are determined then we use a demand and supply curves where they cross that's our wage to determination point if we're going to illustrate where discrimination may occur we'll use that uh, same diagram but illustrated at a different point so the theory suggests that uh, employers consider the marginal revenue productivity of favored groups uh, to be relatively high so their ability to produce more to bring in a higher level of marginal revenue is, is greater and therefore the demand for the discriminated group will be at a different point illustrating lower wages and lower levels of employment so if we want to illustrate discrimination that's the diagram that we would use okay so there are lots of different types of discrimination that your students need to be aware of we're just going to concentrate on gender for the time being why is there a gender pay gap well we know much of it is to do with um, society and the way that society takes care of its families. We know that women are likely to take longer maternity leave than men are to take paternity leave. And also there seems to be a trade-off between when women start their families and the positions in their careers. There's also an argument about access to education. And I think this applies particularly in the developing countries, but you might ask whether that actually applies to the UK. We've got two reports for you trying to illustrate some of the possible causes for the gender pay gap. The first is from the Institute for Fiscal Studies. They're indicating this point to begin with, which is that actually we're seeing lots more people continuing in on to education post 16. So the number of students who are leaving education with just GCSE level qualifications has dropped considerably over the last 15 to 20 years number of students taking or leaving education just A levels has steadily increased but notice that one on the right hand side there the number of people coming away with degree level qualifications has markedly increased over the last 15 years or so the other interesting point there is the difference between men and women has altered slightly but generally men and women are just as likely to take degree level qualifications so the level of qualification wouldn't seem to be the thing that impacts upon the gender pay gap. But look at this, no matter what le level of qualification people come away from education with, that pay gap occurs. 
even with degree level students the pay gap is very clearly marked there. Here's an interesting one though trying to illustrate that point about what happens after the birth of the first child. So before the birth of the first child yes there is a pay gap there but it, it markedly increases after that first child as time progresses. Second report for you and again there's the URL at the bottom of the screen there for you if you want to have a look at the full report here is from Deloitte and they're looking at how uh, the impact of STEM subjects in education have, have made a difference for women. Here's some statistics for you on uh, A-levels so it's thought that in terms of STEM subjects at GCSE level there doesn't appear to be much difference between what boys and girls take. However at A level there's a very clear difference between the number of boys taking STEM subjects and the number of girls taking STEM, STEM subjects. So 187,000 boys compared to 130,000 girls. However when you look at the performance of girls in those STEM subjects, if you look at that right hand column there, girls outperform boys in every single subject. So when girls take the subject, they tend to actually do better than the boys. But the question is, why are fewer girls taking STEM subjects? Now the Deloitte's report doesn't really try to answer that question, but it's an interesting one perhaps to give to your students. Another little consideration for you, just thinking about potentials for pay gap, is what impact will automation have in the future? So thinking about industries where as uh, more and more automation occurs, will that have an impact on those industries which are primarily occupied by men compared to women? And here's some interesting figures for you. That actually those occupations which have a medium or high risk of being impacted actually are more likely to have women in there than men. So it could be that automation is going to have a particularly high impact upon the opportunity for women and for women to earn higher wages. Okay, so the conclusions of the Deloitte report state this, that actually uh, the biggest single impact upon the difference between uh, men and women's potential for earnings in any particular industry is the subjects that they've studied. That actually by not studying STEM subjects as much, that reduces the chance for women to earn more in the future as the STEM type of industries are more likely to bring in higher wages. The final part of the Deloitte report says this then, that whilst there is a convergence in the pay gap, it won't actually be equal until about 2069, so quite a few years away there. Other major impacts then, we know that if somebody is a part-time worker, even if they're doing the same job as their full-time colleague, they are likely to earn less money. And statistics show us that we've got one in seven men uh, working in, in a part-time capacity, whilst three in seven women. So on the basis that part-time workers generally get paid less than their full-time colleagues, that's clearly going to have an impact upon women. And also the unknown factor is how much genuine discrimination takes place. So genuine discrimination could be taking place, but of course if an employer was to admit that, They'd be, they'd be admitting that they're breaking the law and therefore liable to prosecution. So we don't know full statistics on genuine employer discrimination. Okay, what's the impact of that discrimination then? So generally the theory suggests that if people think that they will earn lower wages than their colleagues, they're likely to be less motivated and therefore have a lower level of productivity. There's also an argument here that if people perceive their opportunities for earning higher wages in the future are reduced, they're less likely to go for industries where, where they may earn higher wages. So thinking about those STEM industries again. Okay, there is also an argument then that uh, removal of discrimination would lead to higher economic growth and potentially a high level of international competitiveness for the countries who reduce that discrimination. Quick reminder then, very emotive subject discrimination. Students should try when they're making their arguments to keep very clearly to the economic point of view, although making some remark about societal aims has relevance in longer answer conclusions.
couple of resources for you. The first one is a set of case studies of where uh, discrimination has appeared to have taken place in the UK, where one group of workers has taken an employer to court, uh, and in many cases they've been proven to be correct and discrimination has taken place, and in some cases they have been proved to be incorrect, the discrimination didn't take place. So a series of about 16 different um, case studies for your students to have a look at, giving them some evidence and ammunition when they're making uh, their case about wage discrimination. And the second resource for you is called Citizens Advice Bureau, where the students are given a, a, some information about employment laws in the UK and then are meant to act as if they were working at the Citizens Advice Bureau. Somebody comes in and gives them a particular scenario and they need to work out which law is being impacted upon. Okay. Quick reminder about our Facebook groups and the fact that the resources I've just mentioned will be available on those uh, groups alongside our website. And if you haven't done so already, please do sign up for our Daily Digest. And if you're a Twitter user, again, please uh, follow either the, the main tutor to you um, Twitter address or Jeff Riley's or my own. Thank you for listening and hope to hear and see from you again.